The people walked in little groups toward the beach. They talked and laughed. Some of them sang. There were strange, rare odors abroad. She was beginning to realize her position in the universe as a human being and to recognize her relations as an individual to the world within and about her. On the eve of the 20th century, Kate Chopin confronted the fundamental dilemma of what it meant to be a woman. In a stream of stories and in her novel, The Awakening, she explored the unsparing truth of women's submerged lives. Chopin's stories were set in Louisiana in the aftermath of war. It would be a landscape that she would draw from memory in the final years of her life. Kate Chopin's own story began four decades earlier, further north along the river. St. Louis in the 1850s still harbored the spirit of a fur trading town, but the city was expanding as waves of settlers passed through to the west. Here on the Front Street levee, Captain Thomas O'Flaherty, an Irish merchant, furnished them with boats and supplies. He had married Eliza Farris when she was only 16, but her family had fallen on hard times and needed financial support. She gave him legitimacy in the French Creole aristocracy. In 1850, their daughter Kate was born. They were doing well, then fate intervened. On November 1st, 1855, Thomas O'Flaherty joined city leaders in celebration of a new line of the Pacific Railroad. Just as the train crossed a bridge, the structure buckled under the weight. Ten cars plunged 30 feet into the river amidst rain and lightning. Kate's father and 29 others were killed. Kate was only five in a household now run solely by women. Her great-grandmother, Madame Victoire Chalaville, determined to take over her education. She taught Kate music and French. The nuns at Sacred Heart Convent took over her days with an elite education for French intellectual women. It was unusual, given that most girls didn't go to school at all. There, she met Kitty Garachet, a classmate. They had the kind of friendship that a lot of girls have that really helps, um, helps them throughout life, having someone to tell secrets to and to share a lot of things with. It just was the one lasting relationship throughout Kate's life. But there were hardships. Civil war intervened. Tragedies in the O'Flaherty household multiplied with the deaths of Kate's half-brother and Madame Charleville. Kitty's family was forced to leave town when it was learned that her father was supplying the Confederates with guns. Kate and Kitty did not see each other for years. When they finally came together again in the late 1860s, they were young women of marriageable age. I do not think that Kate resembled her mother so much as her father, Kitty remembered. She was an Irish beauty. Her eyes were brown and looked right at you.
Meanwhile, Kitty had decided to enter a convent. It was as if a curtain had fallen between them. The 1870s was a time of few choices for women. Kate's questioning of Catholicism and of women's roles came to the fore in her story, Lilacs. Madame Adrienne Faraval never announced her coming, but the good nuns knew very well to look for her. With the scent of lilacs, Sister Agatha would turn to the window, upon her face the happy, beatific expression with which pure and simple souls watch for the coming of those they love. Adrienne rang the bell. The door was opened cautiously by a lay sister, who stood there with downcast eyes and flaming cheeks, saying, by order of our mother superior, after which she closed the door. Adrienne remained, stunned. The lilacs fell from her arms. What the story sets up is this, this relationship, this tension between the need in people's lives for, sec for sensuality, for the physical, for that kind of innocence and uh, physicality represented by childhood that uh, Adrienne comes to recapture, Adrienne Farival comes to recapture in her time uh, at the convent. Set against that is the morality, a rigid morality of Catholicism, which will not permit, the, uh, will, not, will not tolerate the juxtaposition of innocence and, and physicality and sensuality that you either have to be innocent or you have to be sexual. You can't be both. Kate chose another path and stepped into a world of social engagements. Many were held at Oakland, the elegant country home of Louis Benoit. It was the heart of St. Louis's French Creole society. At one of these gala affairs, Kate met Oscar Chopin, the son of a wealthy Louisiana planter and a relative of the Benoit family. On June 9, 1870, they married and embarked on a three-month tour of Europe. By the time they reached Paris, the Franco-Prussian War had broken out. On August 19, Kate despaired. Rain still falling, so Oscar went out alone and returned with the very sad news of the war. Never have the French armies suffered such repeated mortifications. Oscar and Kate were forced to retreat to his native Louisiana. They settled in New Orleans in the fall of 1870. It was a world unto itself. She arrived in the city pregnant with her first child. She recalled, I can remember yet that hot southern day on Magazine Street, New Orleans. Waking from out of a stupor to see in my mother's arms a little piece of humanity all dressed in white which they told me was my little son. Over the decade, five more children were born. Kate's time in New Orleans offered characters and settings to explore. But to Oscar, the city stirred only bitter frustration. Business at the Cotton Exchange was down 40%. The aftermath of the war affected everyone, white and black alike. Kate's fiction would explore some of the racial tensions that had swept through the city during and before her time there. Zoraide had seen the beau Mesor dance the bambula in Congo Square, as proud looking as a king and Zoraid grew sick with love for Mezor. But when Zoraid kneeled before her mistress and asked to marry Mezor, 
Madame de la Riviere was speechless with rage. Mazor was sold away into Georgia, where he would no longer hear his Creole tongue spoken, nor dance Kalinda, nor hold La Belle Zoraide in his arms. When their baby was born, Zoraide came out of the awful shadow. But the baby was removed and sent away to Madame's plantation far up the coast. Zoraide could only moan, Limuri, Limuri, and turned her face to the wall. She was known ever after as Zoraide Lafal. With Chopin, the dark crannies of the human soul were part of what it is to be human. It was part of her war against platitudes. If you look only at the surfaces, you're not be going to begin to understand what people are about. It's a measure of both her talent and her character, her, her strength as a woman, that she didn't find the depths of the human soul, even human d depravity, threatening. Where Kate explored, Oscar leapt to take a stand. He joined a white league in opposition to black leaders and union forces. On September 14, 1874, the league led a full-scale riot in New Orleans. It took a week for federal troops to restore order. Five years later, economic pressures finally forced the Chopins to move. In 1879, they retreated to Oscar's ancestral home in northwest Louisiana. Here, along the Red River in Natchitoches Parish, lay remnants of one of the oldest French plantation communities in America. She was plunked into a tiny town of 600, 700 people. There was really just one long street and then fields. She never fit in. The land became the central focus of Chopin's first novel, At Fault, and many of her short stories. There were acres of open land cultivated in a slovenly fashion, but so rich that cotton and corn and weed and cocoa grass grew rampant. The Negro quarters were at the far end of this open stretch and consisted of a long row of old and very crippled cabins. Directly back of these, a dense wood grew and held much mystery and witchery of sound and shadow and strange lights when the sun shone. Of a gin house, there was left scarcely a trace. They dealt with the despair of Creoles ruined by the war. About the great solemn pillars, she reached her arms and pressed her cheek and lips upon the senseless brick. Adieu. Adieu, she whispered. She had grown very old. While the outward pressure of a young and joyous existence had forced her footsteps into the light, her soul had stayed in the shadow of the ruin. They told of Acadians, or former slaves gathering for weekly dances in the woods. Telesphora, looking out across the prairie, could see them coming from all directions. The little Creole ponies, the mule carts, the Negro musicians. There was the same scene every Saturday at Fauché's, and all on account of the gumbo. Fauché stormed at Old Black Dute for her extravagance. She hurled it back at him while into the pot went the chickens and the pans full of minced ham and the fists full of onion and sage and piment rouge. She knew how to cook.
There was a great demand for short fiction at that period, and one of the genres that was most popular was the one known as local color, which offered uh, descriptions of some of the varied parts of the country, uh, exotic parts of the country. It was pretty clear to her early on that it was her southern stories, her Louisiana stories, that sold. While the land inspired her imagination, her time there was limited. A mere three years after they had arrived, Oscar became ill with malaria and died. It was 15 days before Christmas. Kate tried to hang on, taking over Oscar's place as manager of their plantation store, even keeping shop herself. By 1884, legal matters were settled. Kate moved back to her native St. Louis, now a major commercial center. Chopin seemed happy and the children were settled. Then on June 28, 1885, her mother Eliza O'Flaherty died. It was devastating. Kate felt she had lost her best friend. She was now absolutely alone, with six children to support, the oldest of whom was 14. She had only a modest income. In the 1880s, writing was one of the few ways women could make a living, averaging some 15 to $30 a story and a few hundred for a novel. At the age of 45, Chopin began her own journey towards becoming a published writer. The writer she especially admired was the short story and novella writer Guy de Maupassant, who perfected a kind of writing that she took very seriously. Here was life, not fiction, she wrote in her diary. Here was a man who escaped from tradition and authority and who, in a direct and simple way, told us what he saw. Her first work, a poem, appeared in January 1889. Soon it was her short stories that proved most successful. Her social world expanded. Her home became a literary center. She used to have these Thursday afternoon soirees and uh, the, all the poets and the writers and the editors and people who happened to be in town were there. She seemed to be thriving, but how much freedom did an artist really have? In 1897, Chopin was beginning her most ambitious novel, The Awakening. Edna had attempted all summer to learn to swim, but that night she was like the little tottering, stumbling, clutching child who of a sudden realizes its powers and walks for the first time alone, boldly and with overconfidence. Once she turned and looked toward the shore, a quick vision of death smote her soul. The novel is set on Grand Isle, a fashionable resort for New Orleans elite. It is the story of Edna Pintillier, a discontented wife and mother. Her visit to the island and the sensuality of the gulf trigger an awakening. Its uh, spontaneity and its, its um, physical demands opens up Edna to places in her heart and in her soul that she hadn't, she'd lost contact with, maybe had never known was there. Edna, left alone in the little side room, loosened her clothes, removing the greater part of them. She looked at her round arms as she held them straight up and rubbed them one after the other, observing closely, as if it were something she saw for the first time, the fine, firm quality and texture of her flesh. I don't think any other writer of the period, uh, certainly, uh, no male writer, and I don't think any other woman writer, uh, tried to understand what happens when a woman experiences her own sexual being and her own self. That's exactly the, the tragedy and the, 
and the dilemma that Chopin is exploring in her fiction, which is what happens? How do you get past this, this uh, bind for women that if you possess your own self, if you possess your own body, you know, that the options that society offers you are marriage and death? By novel's end, Edna has awakened to herself, but finds no place for that self in the world she knows. She swims out to sea till her strength is gone. The water of the gulf stretched out before her, gleaming with the million lights of the sun. Along the white beach, up and down, there was no living thing in sight. She walked out. The water was chill, but she walked on. The water was deep, but she lifted her white body and reached out with a long, sweeping stroke. She went on and on. I think Edna's suicide comes from the recognition that she was never going to have what she wanted, and some glimmering that what she really wanted didn't exist in the world. And that's why I think the suicide is portrayed um, almost as a kind of coming home rather than an act of despair. The question was whether Americans were prepared to read such emancipated fiction. There were a few positive letters. Then the critical reviews came in. They destroy her spirit. Uh, when they came out with all of this adverse reaction. And uh, one of the newspapers called it pure poison and not fit for babes. And uh, there was an awful lot of criticism. Once you begin to push against those margins, against those limits, you begin to uh, offend people. You begin to offend convention and expectations. And that's exactly what Kate Chopin ran into with The Awakening. After the harsh reception of her novel, Chopin retreated into private life. She sank into obscurity. There was a brief moment of optimism when the Louisiana Exposition, a World's Fair, came to St. Louis. On August 20th, 1904, Chopin visited the fairgrounds. Right there at her doorstep were uh, uh, representatives of the nations from all over the globe, and there was lights, and there was uh, action, and there were dancing, and uh, there were things to see and things to do, and you can understand why she would like to put a lot of time in over there on that midway. It was a hot day, and she returned exhausted. That night, she had a stroke. I think Dad was the last one to see her alive. But he spoke of her with such pride. What drove Kate Chopin was her passion for writing and her willingness to let writing take her into places that she had never been herself necessarily and certainly that the literary traditions that out of which she came had never really gone. It was in the late 20th century that her writings were really recovered. Uh, they came back into print and they were newly recognized and appreciated by critics and taught in schools and that's what that's what brings a writer back into currency. The rediscovery of the awakening came as a godsend, the most incredible gift to the women's movement. I first read her when I was given a copy of the awakening by a, a woman who said to me, you should read this book. And the big question that we all asked ourselves was, how did Kate Chopin know all that in 1899? She's one of those writers whose sense of craft puts her right on the edge of poetry. She could have shouted for joy. 
A feeling of exultation overtook her, as if some power of significant import had been given her to control the working of her body and her soul. How strange and awful to stand naked under the sky. How delicious. She felt like some newborn creature, opening its eyes in a familiar world it had never known. To learn more about Kate Chopin or Reawakening, visit LPB online at the internet address on your screen. This is PBS.